sit down for just a second while I pass out some announcements for you. Uh, you see here we have this pink sheet. Uh, it's got all the things that are going on here at St. Luke's and of course three things that are not on here that I need to make you aware of. Um, so there's several things on here that are going on. Uh, Stephen's ministry training, which is on the back side. We need more Stephen's ministers. We have space. We have a need. Uh, there's people who catastrophe has hit their lives, uh, whether it's emotional, social, relational. There's different things that happen with health. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And our Stephen's ministers are individuals who are highly trained to meet you, meet those individuals where they're at and walk alongside them through the process of recovery. So uh, we have several ministers uh, already, a uh, handful of those. Are any of them here as I'm looking around? I, I don't think it's, was Rose back behind me? Yep, I'm going to say Rose is here. Um, so great. So Rose is on deck. So if you have any questions, ask Rose. <laughs> and she'll fill you in. It's great though, right? Cool. And we need, we need to have more people because some people are moving to live with their kids. And yeah. great kids. <laughs> it's hard to argue against that. But that's okay. We can also try to convince them to stay. Anyway, uh, two other things. Um, we are in the Hail Mary. I'm going to use football references today. <laughs> Probably wrong. We're in the Hail Mary situation uh, with the camping for this summer. So you know that we do a camp out every year at St. Luke's. Uh, we, our last chance to get spots up at Tahoe is going to be Monday morning at 8 o'clock. So if you are able to run a computer... <clears throat> And you are able to reserve campsites. And you might not know what that looks like. I will send you a video tutorial on how to do it. We need all hands on deck to try to get that accomplished. Uh, we haven't been able to get any spots. And this is our last chance for the weekend of the 9th, 10th, and 11th so, of August. That's what I mean, last chance for the school start in the... Yes, right after July. <laughs> school starts on the 12th. Yes, for adults and for kids. We have a lifelong educator over here, so sorry. We did try to get the weeks earlier, but we couldn't get them. We've been trying for the end of July, and we have not been able to get any of the spots. That's what I mean, it's the last Hail Mary. So anyway, that's coming up. Uh, hygiene kits for men. Uh, they're the plastic bags down in the fellowship hall. Uh, we're collecting hygiene kits, and if you're wondering what should go in there, um, there's an example bag out there, but you take the bag home, you fill it, you bring it back, and then we get those uh, to gentlemen in our community who have the need. And so if you'd like to be one of those this month, that would be wonderful. The last thing I wanted to point out, you'll see on the top, um, we are looking for drama people for the Easter services. Not all of them, specifically not the sunrise, but at 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11, and then 5.30 p.m. I know that's new. I'll tell you about that later. Um, we need somebody. So I need somebody who is uh, of white hair who can grow a healthy beard by Easter. If you're not... Can't, no, sorry, Kate, you can't do it. Uh, actually, I don't know. Can you grow a healthy beard? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, but uh, if, if not, we're trying to get Andy uh, to do it, Andy Walt. So uh, talk to him after service. You'll see him. He's the only guy here who's got a big white beard. Uh, but we need him to play a Pharisee. We also need somebody to play Mary Magdalene. It's very easy. Um, I know. <laughs> We need somebody to play Mary Magdalene. So if you're willing to do that for those services, we need a, a, a younger lady to do that. Uh, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you, Melissa. We can talk about that more. So anyways, there's tons of things going on. Grab your pink sheet, put it in your purse, put it in your pocket, set that aside. But right now, stand up, greet one another in the name of the Lord, shake some hands, introduce yourself to somebody new.
throughout the generation that tells us who God is and how he works in this world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we affirm together the words of the Apostles' Creed as we begin our worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From men he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The same old singers are going to lead us in our next worship song.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And because the kids are way faster, kids, Odyssey. <laughs> See ya. Thank you, guys. And now you can take your time. It's been quite a morning. Uh, I, uh, I would have lost my head if it wasn't attached to my neck. I got up this morning, I did my usual, which is post the sermon onto the website, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go swim, so I put all my clothes, thanks, buddy, um, into my gym bag, and I went, and then I realized I was forgetting a crucial part of my wardrobe, a belt. And so I've got this, this uh, Jed Clampett thing going with like my, uh, my acolytes, Cinchers. It's very classy. Um, and I'm glad that's on video. I didn't think through that. <laughs> I realized I forgot my microphone at the early service, and there's been fumbles all over the place. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm gonna be ready. You guys know I don't like sports. I don't care. Exactly. That's exactly. I'm just, that's dropping the ball, right? A fumble's when you like drop the ball, yeah. and then people like try to dive for it. Oh my God. Nobody offered to give me a belt. But anyway, so yeah, you guys are going to have a great time. I know it's the Rams, who used to be in St. Louis, who had Kurt Warner playing for them back in the 90s who were playing. Are you impressed yet? <laughs> I love that because when I went to St. Louis, I told everybody that I was from northern Iowa, and they said, oh, that's where Kurt Warner went. And I was like, yeah, he's the other famous guy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Good luck, have fun. Uh, try not to let gluttony and anger uh, press in upon your festivities and fellowship time. Did I just ruin it? Sorry. Um, but it'll, it'll still be a lot of fun. Uh, this morning we're gonna continue in our sermon series on living out hope. And we're going to talk about Jesus's life and his experience there in Luke chapter four. Now last week we started with Jesus's visit to Nazareth, back home. Here's the very beginning of his ministry to give you some context. Luke chapter 3, at the end of that, Jesus is getting baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. At the beginning of chapter 4, he's out in the temptation in the wilderness by Satan. Then the next thing we see, he's stopping in after he's begun his ministry. He doesn't really say what he's doing. He stops back in at Nazareth, and he mentions, you heard what I did in Capernaum. So we know that there was a little bit that went on there that we don't really know about, but we kind of get the details starting after his home visit, which you know they tried to run him out of town after trying to kill him. Um, and then he goes into Capernaum. He goes back to Capernaum, which is a large city. It's one of the top largest, the four largest, around the Sea of Galilee, the northern part of, well, Israel, what would have been, not at that time. Um, and he is there. It's a, it's a large city. It's a fishing city. There's lots of people around. I mean, it's not like Reno large or Sparks large, but for the area, it's, it's big, you know, a few thousand people. And he's there, and he starts doing his ministry. We hear that he's preaching with authority. His word goes out, and people hear it, and they're like, wow, what kind of authority and wisdom does his word have? And then he starts doing different healings and miracles. It says that he healed uh, a man of a demon. He rebuked the demon. In Luke chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus rebuked him, the demon, not the man, saying, be silent, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown the man down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And he stood over, oh, here's the other thing that happened right afterwards. So he's still in Capernaum, he goes to Simon's mother-in-law's house, and it's okay, you can go to the next one. We're good, John. Thanks, buddy. Um, he goes to her house. Simon is Simon Peter, the other disciple, uh, the one that you probably know about. And he goes to her house, and she's got a very, very high fever. They come and ask Jesus, would you please heal her, because it's bad. You know, fevers are bad, especially in that time. He stood over her, and he rebuked the fever. And it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Then it says he goes into the surrounding area, so this northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, all that, that wonderful space, and he does other things. He rebukes more demons. The demons also came out, many crying, you are the Son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. The big message at the end is he says, I can't stay here in Capernaum. I've got to go out through all the towns and preach the good news, for that's why I came. That's kind of the end message of this section. But I want to draw your attention to that verb that's used with Jesus and his ministry. Rebuked. Kind of sounds like Peter. Rebuked. 
kind of have that nasty taste in your mouth. Because when you hear the word rebuke, you think I'm about to be chastised for something, right? It's not something that sits very well. So in my household, we use this phrase called yes, dad. <laughs> and you heard me use it before? Some of you were kind of laughing. Okay, Kimberly's heard it. Um, yes, dad. So I learned it uh, from my, my uncle when I was in college. I was being discipled by him. And I realized that it wasn't just uh, discipleship to learn spiritual things, spiritual maturity, just when we met at the coffee house in the mornings. I would go to their house. I'd spend time with them. I'd watch how my aunt would interact with the children and how their, their relationship would be. And I learned a lot of things. And I learned this phrase that he used with his children. He has four. Yes, dad. So when, I, when he would give his kids commands, like I give my kids directions, sometimes we as sinners, they as many sinners, respond with, I should be in control and I should get to dictate how and when and what I do. So there's these kind of negotiations, like, no, I'm not going to do that, or no, I don't want to do that, uh, can we do this instead, or and all the negotiation and the compromise that tries to happen. And you know, most of the time I just shut that down the way Scott does. They're going through their whole argument saying, Yes, Dad. Which means this conversation is over. Your response is, yes, Dad. And usually at that moment, it's a miracle. I'm telling you, if you use it, use it consistently. Don't spoil it. They just shut down. The whole argument shuts down, and they comply. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Because I realize the conversation is over. It is wild. I'm serious, it actually works. It does It works. You're like, oh, yes, yes, that works better than yes, mommy, maybe? <laughs> well, we can talk about that later. <laughs> but yeah, it, work, it works really well because there's two things that go into a rebuke that make it effective. <clears throat> the first thing is authority. The word which is used uh, in the Greek and even in the Hebrew before that, it's the same word, just translated in different languages, has the notion of authority. There's an honor to it. When I say it to my kids, they assume that I have authority in the situation. For instance, if I was to say to you, if you were starting to complain to me, say about the length of the service, the length of the sermon, the temperature, the weather, or anything else here at church, and I said, yes, pastor, <laughs> you would probably not respond <laughs> in a healthy way. <laughs> Because there's not that same kind of authority concept that there is with my children. So my children understand that I have authority in the situation. And the other piece is it is a right, a good standing reprove or questioning or direction. Having all the authority in the world but never giving the right direction doesn't make a rebuke effective. Does that make sense? Sometimes I like to pick on my kids a little bit and I'll tell them, like, give me your hand. I want to bite your finger off. Because we play there. You guys don't do that. Okay. <laughs> we play because I don't want to get them worked up. And what I end up doing is giving them a smoochie or something like that. Or just pretending like, I don't know. We're weird, I guess. We'll talk about that later. Um, but, yes, Dad. Respond, respond. And it's laughing and it's playing. But that's not a real rebuke. They don't take it seriously. They're like, they're just joking. Because it's playful. Because even though I have all the authority in the world in that situation, the correction is not right. It's not real. It doesn't make sense. The same way if you were to say to them or inconsistently say to them, yes, dad, you're not their dad. I pray that they wouldn't respond saying, you're not their dad. <laughs> if they do, let me know. And I'll fix that. <clears throat> but it's that same thing. Now, the cool part about how this word gets used in the Old Testament, which I, I got to tell you about because I'm so excited to find it, is this word gets used in reference to God's authority and his will, his correction, his reproof, saying this is how things are going to go. But the way it gets used as when God rebukes something with his word, it inspires and evokes his work. In other words, when God says something, his authority is so vast and so marvelous and so all-encompassing that things just happen. Let there be light. Right? And no more work is needed. Out of nothing, light says, yeah, I'm here. Ready and accounted for. He did the same thing. Isaiah 50 uh, verse 2 calls up and uh, brings up the story of the exodus out of Egypt. And he says that he rebuked the Red Sea and the Red Sea split so they could walk on dry land. By a word of his mouth, he can control the natural elements and all those things. Because that speaks to his authority, his honor of being able to say, here and no further will you move, will you stand. 
and also his good, perfect, and pleasing will, which he is calling into reality in that circumstance. Why is that important? Jesus rebukes his enemies. Even the demons submit without a question to his word. They respond in submission. You'll notice also, so does the fever. It responds. You're starting to get this picture that all of our enemies, sin, death, and the devil, because that's what fevers were coming from and what it was ultimately going to produce, all submit willingly to his authority. And I say willingly because he's just that powerful. There's no question. He goes on in Luke chapter 8. I'm not wrong, which I hope not, because I wrote it. <coughs> Luke chapter 8, 24, perfect. You'll remember that he was out on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and he falls asleep in a boat, and then this huge storm comes up. Wind and waves kick up, which is a really dangerous time, because we don't have seafaring boats. And they went, and they woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. Because Jesus of Nazareth is God. In his rebuke, he carries all honor and authority, and he enacts the very good, perfect, and pleasing will of God so that all things obey his word <coughs> and fall into compliance with God's will. That's wonderful. When things need to be held back, when things need to be called into question, when things need to be lined up and made plumb, this is the right way to go, this is the right way life should happen. Jesus' rebuke makes it so. Well, as you can imagine following Jesus, we all like to get into this notion of, okay, Jesus does it, we do it. Because that's how you learn, that's how you grow as a disciple. And in Luke, in Luke chapter 9, which I know I didn't give you, there's this really funny story. Um, that kind of starts this new section where it's not just Jesus rebuking, but his people are going to start rebuking. And they go to this town, and James and John get a little upset because the town rejects him and says, we don't want you here. And James and John go to Jesus and say, do you, if you want, we can call down fire on this place and destroy it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, we've heard the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know we can bring a holy help by another place. Just ask us to do it. We realize you could do it, but we really want to do it. <laughs> and Jesus rebukes them. Because they don't have in mind the kingdom of heaven, which is made in the gospel of their teacher, Jesus. They have in mind a different kind of law. Not even God's law, but a self-righteous law. And that's a real trick. That's a real trick. I've, I've noticed in my own uh, spiritual life, in my own sin life, that I typically, and I think you will too, I judge other people's failures by my own successes. And I judge my failures by my excuses. I'm a lot more compassionate with people's failures when I share the same failure. But if I'm actually pretty good at it and you're not, I typically want to hold you to a pretty high account. Even though it might be a good and righteous thing. Because it's more about me than it is about you. It's more about my righteousness rather than Jesus's. You see that in the heart of James and John. They're like, oh, they didn't receive you. We received you. Let's call down fire and torch this place. There's going to be three other stories of rebuke that we need to learn from so that we understand what exactly is our role in relationship with each other. Because as we live in the gospel, the church sometimes gets this weird culture where we think, judge not, lest ye be judged. And we think, to each to his own. And we'll just let everybody kind of do their own thing and manage their own circumstance. We're not called to that either. Because in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus teaches his disciples to pay attention. Wait. To each other, not first. Pay attention to yourselves. Look first at yourself. And if your brother sins, rebuke him. In authority, with goodwill and intention, hold them to an account. And if he repents, forgive him. Do you see the structure that he's making? He's saying, first, if you understand the law of God and how it relates to you, then, because it says, 
pay attention to yourself. If that's the case, then if you see a brother who is in sin, who's struggling with things that are holding and enslaving him to sin, rebuke him. In authority, present him with the truth. Not your truth, not your version of the truth, not a self-righteous version of the truth, but with the will of God. With the law. So that, nope, I'm still on that verse. It says, and, I'm going to tell you, so that he repents. That you may forgive him. The purpose of the law is not just to hold people to an account, but to guide them into the forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. That's why we know that the law was given and loved by God, not so that we would have that weird, pukey heartburn every time we hear God's will, but so that it would drive us to confession and to the salvation that Jesus has won in his gospel. That's the purpose of the law, not to make us self-righteous. Well, in Luke chapter 18, and then in chapter 19, we get some stories where the disciples are like, okay, cool. We're going to rebuke some people. This is going to be great. We're going to practice. 15. Uh, the people, the crowd, were bringing even the infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they're like, okay, you're here to preach in the synagogues. That's for men only. And you're here to do some miracles only for the people who are going to get in here. And we're going to do this right. We're going to keep it organized. Not for the kids. We rebuke you. Keep those kids away from here. They should be present, but they shouldn't be heard. And then Jesus responds. You know how Jesus responds? Jesus hears the rebuke of his disciples, and then he calls them to him, saying, Let those little kids come to me. Don't hinder them, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't let them get away with a bad rebuke and with a bad authority. He says, No, this is what the gospel is, guys. It's for, it's for all people. Later on in Luke chapter 18, we get another situation where it's not the 12 disciples, it's some of the extended disciples. They're down in uh, the southern part, down by Judah. They're near Jericho. They're on the move. <coughs> and as they head past Jericho, you know Jericho with the peas? Yes. 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 I was just questioning who's seen Veggie Tales, but apparently not a lot of you. We have right now media here at the church. You can download that. You can watch Veggie Tales online on its Netflix, and you'll love it. Anyway, the story of Joshua and Jericho. And they go to this, the town, and as they're passing by, a blind beggar hears them. And he hears the commotion, and he says, who's passing by? And they say, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And then he cries out, son of David, have mercy on me. And those front disciples who are leaving for session are like, dude, be quiet. We got places to go, we got things to do. Your statue, your, your place and status in life, shh, be quiet. And he cries out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And though this whole procession is on their way to the next phase of ministry, the next part of ministry, Jesus takes one moment to stop and he asks the man, What do you want of me? He came near and he asked him, What do you want for me to do? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. In chapter 19, we have Jesus entering into the triumphal entry. Okay, he's going into Jerusalem for his passion. You know that that was a big to-do, right? The Palm Sunday thing. Hosanna, Hosanna, everybody's out there visiting as he's coming in. And all of his disciples are meeting up for this big, huge event. And there's some Pharisees there in the crowd. And they say to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're causing a ruckus. Jesus says to them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Every single time the people try to rebuke, Jesus corrects them. Because here's some things that we need to realize. Not only can we not judge people according to our own righteousness, but we can't judge them according to our own law. Our own perspective on how things should go. Do you know what that means? If you look at every one of these stories, the first, well, at least the first two in there, with the kids, with the beggar, that means that all people in the gospel of Jesus have access to Jesus. 
No matter their plight, no matter their circumstance, no matter their upbringing, no matter their culture, no matter where they hope their life goes or where it's been, all people deserve to have access to Jesus. Because that's the promise of the gospel. That he's come for all people, all nations, all tribes and tongues. And Jesus doesn't just promise salvation and hope for tomorrow, guys. This plays into every moment of our lives and how we live as Christians in this world. Because Jesus makes a lot of promises, even in those rebukes and all of his teaching. Because he says, the thieves come to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you would have life and have it in abundance. That means that in Jesus, all people have access in this life to hope. All people should have access to joy. And all people should have access to life. That, 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 is, the, that is the will of God. Sorry, it just gets me. It's been, a, it's been a week, you know. Our job as the people of God is to call rebuke, but not to limit access to Jesus in any way, shape, or form. Because in every one of those circumstances, Jesus has quick words saying, yeah, my gospel is bigger than your perspective. It's bigger than your prejudice. It's bigger than your plans and your justice. And may it never be that we, like the Pharisees, look at what Jesus is doing in his ministry and say, yeah, we don't support your movement. <clears throat> we expect you to fall in line with our hopes and expectations. How dare you call up worship for these people, from this time, from this ministry. So, We've got a lot to learn in how we bring the authority of Jesus as his called disciples and people into the lives of each other and others in this world. I hope you learn at least from those two pieces what our call in the gospel is. There is one rebuke in the story of Luke, uh, Luke's gospel uh, that Jesus doesn't question him. You might be familiar with it in Luke chapter 23. The other rebuked him, saying, do, not do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. You know who we're talking about? Man crucified to the right of Jesus, talking to the one on his left. And then he looks to Jesus and he says, Remember me when you come to your kingdom. And does Jesus tell him it's not for you? I'm more concerned about justice and what's right and what's good for my life and my neighborhood. <clears throat> he says, I say to you, today you will be with me. Because the rebuke came from our own realization, his realization of who he is under the law. And that same will pointed him to the one chance, the one hope he had as he was gasping for his last breath. The Son of God who was crucified next to him. And that was met with Christ's authority. As he makes a promise that even though death might try to swallow you up <coughs> with me, you have victory. Second Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25 teach us how to bring this kind of law and gospel and confession and repentance into each other's lives. And I'm going to tell you right now, I realize this is more than we can do in a Sunday morning sermon. This is why we have classes and we have oikos and we teach and we disciple and we talk through this stuff. Paul is teaching Timothy how to do this in Ephesus. And he says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone, 
able to teach, look at that next word, patiently enduring evil. Correcting his opponents with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. It's not that we don't call sin a sin. But when we see sin, we know how to deal with it by leading them into the hope in Jesus' name. Because it's in his authority, it's in his perfect obedience to the will of God and his submission unto death that we have full access to the will of God and we have been brought into it to the hope of life everlasting. That is our grace. That's our identity and that's our purpose as a community and part of this national community and world. To Christ's glorious name be praised. Amen. May the peace of God which transcends understanding guard your hearts and your mind and watch your faith in Christ Jesus. At this time we're going to <clears throat> gather our tithes and our offerings. And I invite you, if you're new to St. Luke's, there's a welcome card there in your pew. If you have any questions about what we've talked about or you want to talk about what's going on in your life, I'd be happy if you fill that card out. Leave it in the bag as it comes along, and I'll email you this week, and we can find some time to connect and help you grow in your spiritual life as well.
take some time as we journey towards the Lord's Supper to consider our own need for salvation, to confess our sins. So I want you to take a couple minutes, a few moments, to consider all those opportunities we've had to present the will of God in a brother's or sister's life. I'm not talking about others, I'm talking about other Christians. And where we've missed that, we skipped that because of fear of persecution or questioning or labeling. And ultimately, all we've done is leave them in their flight and not driven them to its fulfillment. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we've done a lot of judging and not a lot of pointing towards the fulfillment of the law and the gospel of Jesus. We've left people with no hope and only condemnation. I don't know where you're at in all of that, but I know the Lord will lay it on your heart. So take just a moment. We, like the disciples, without even a lot of understanding, come to this place where Christ shows us the full extent of his love, his authority, and the reach of his gospel. From the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You are welcome to come forward to receive the forgiveness of sins, to taste the love and the mercy and the life of our Lord Jesus in his body and blood, and know that you have hope in his name. As you know, we'll make two aisles that come down the center, and then you can park to the side if you'd like to come pray. You're welcome to, and you can leave your cups in the two receptacles on each side. You may be seated. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given on Calvary for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat the body of given for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Given on Calvary for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Lord bless you according to your Christian education and hold you steadfast in the lunch. Take and eat the body of Christ. Given on Calvary for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ. Given on Calvary for
know that you go in the favor of the Lord and his grace and mercy which abound this day into life everlasting, that you might have peace until the hope of his resurrection. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As his rejoice, and to beseech the Lord on others' behalf, let us go out in joy as we sing this last song. Maybe the kids will hear us down the hallway.
Yeah.